thank you very much, and it's, it's really a great pleasure to be here early morning on a Sunday. Uh, I'll speak about India's digital transformation and how what has happened over the last several years, which has made a huge difference and created a whole new model of economic growth. I think I'm just waiting for the slides. But, but essentially, uh, over the last several years, India has transformed in many ways. And this digital transformation uh, is at the heart of economic growth and so on. Now, we know what's happening in the world. The world is getting hotter, 1.5 degrees, Paris, and so on. It's getting older. Demographics are changing. Geopolitics is there in every conversation. But as we noticed in the last three days, India is a young, democratic nation with immense potential and expected to be among the leading economies of the world. But actually, when you look below the hood, it's not one big market, or it was not one big market. It had huge variations in cultures, markets, regulations, industrialization. Every state had its own uh, tax system and so on. But what has now happened is all these things have come together to create one mega economy, which brings everything together and leads to immense productivity. So what is fundamentally happening is India is going from an offline, informal, low productivity, multiple set of micro economies to a single, online, formal, high productivity mega economy. And this is the trend of the next 20 years. And you're going to see all this happening every year, year by year. And this has been enabled by a new approach to solving society's issues, which we call as digital public infrastructure. In other words, it's essentially extending the ability of a country to use digital technology at population scale to transform society. And di digital public infrastructure has a number of building blocks. Each block does one thing well, but all the blocks talk to each other, they interoperate, interoperate, and when these blocks come together, they create all kinds of solutions at population scale. Now, it began with the ID system called Aadhaar, uh, which I was uh, in charge of for five years, and the idea was to give a digital ID to every Indian. And today, 1.3 billion Indians have this digital ID. It provides, oh, thank you. It, uh, it provides for uh, online authentication of identity using your uh, fingerprint, iris, OTP, face, whatever. And that system does 80 million transactions a day, which means 80 million times some Indian is using his Aadhaar to do an online verification. Now, this online verification, the second thing built on this was what's called as KYC, or Know Your Customer. And KYC was then made a requirement, Aadhaar KYC was sufficient to open a bank account or to get a mobile connection. And in, 20, in 2014, soon after Prime Minister Modi came to power, on August 28, 2014, he launched the Jandhan Yojana program which is the world's largest financial inclusion program. And more than 400 million bank accounts were opened for people. And they were able to do that very quickly because in Aadhaar EKYC, you could do an online opening of a customer account. And today we have 700 million bank accounts that are linked to their Aadhaar IDs. And the same KYC is also used for non-cash, non like our PDS system uses Aadhaar authentication to create an interoperable network. So it was fundamentally, Aadhaar led to KYC, KYC and Jandan Yojana Prime Minister's initiative led to massive financial inclusion. The same thing happened on the mobile side. The mobile industry adopted eKYC and firms like Geo, Airtel, Idea, Vodafone, etc., all used this to speed in, speed in the rate of customer inclusion in KYC. And therefore, we saw a dramatic change in our networks. We have, uh, Geo was launched in uh, 2016, and it went to 100 million customers in the first six months, giving free cards. All that was done because of Aadhaar KYC. So fundamentally, think about it. You had ID first, 
ID led to KYC, KYC led to banking inclusion, KYC led to mobile inclusion. So they all came together. And the years 2014 to 2016 were very critical for this, because in 2014, as I said, August 28, the Jandan Yojana program was launched, which led to massive financial inclusion on the banking side. In 2015, the Prime Minister launched the Digital India program. The Digital India program included something called Digi Locker, which allows Indians to store their documents on the cloud or on the phones. And 180 million Indians today use DigiLocker to store their uh, other IDs or the vaccination certificates. And that's entirely built by Meti, and it's a remarkable system we all use. 2015, Digital India also launched the digital signature, where now I can use my ID to sign a document on my phone. So if you want to apply for a loan on your phone, you can just sign the document and it's fully certified. So all this infrastructure was laid in 2015. And 2016 was really a seminal year, because in 2016, April 4th, India reached 1 billion Aadhaars. So 1 billion Aadhaars were reached within seven years of the launch. On April 11, 2016, the new payment system, UPI, was launched. On September 5th, 2016, Geo was launched. Somewhere in 2016, the RBI took a decision to launch the account aggregator network. November 8, 2016, we had the withdrawal of currency notes, which gave a huge push to digital payments. So 20, 2014 to 16 had all these momentous events that all led to this massive transformation. So just to give an idea, India went to, did in nine years, what would have taken 47 years by traditional means. So the financial inclusion acceleration in nine years, because of all these various initiatives, and we went from among the most unbanked countries in the world to the, one of the most financially included countries in the world in nine years using technology. Similarly, the same thing happened with UPI. As I said, UPI was launched as a next generation payment system on uh, April 11, 2016. And as late as October of 2016, it was doing only 100,000 transactions a month. And then, of course, all the events happened and today, this is the world's largest payment system. It does 9.66 billion transactions a month. 9.66 billion transactions a month. It has 350 million users. And you can make a digital payment using a QR code at 50 million merchants across the country. Now think about it. Earlier, it took us 75 years for India to reach six to seven million point of sale machines for merchant payments. In a matter of three to four years, we had 50 million QR codes at merchants. So there's a dramatic acceleration of merchant acceptance enabled by UPI. And so all these things came together very quickly. Now, whenever you use a digital platform, it creates data. Data is the byproduct of the usage of a digital platform. And historically, in the rest of the world, data is used by companies to sell to you advertising and whatnot, or by governments to you know, see where you are and so on. But India has invented a unique idea, which is how can individuals and small businesses use their own data? We call this as the data empowerment architecture my friend Chandra talked about it on the opening day. And fundamentally, we have an architecture in India now where every individual and every business can use the digital footprint and use that and monetize it in different ways. And that's why we call this as digital capital. So this is a whole new idea that individuals can use their digital capital to get ahead in life. They can use their data to get a better loan, to get a better job, to get better skills. And therefore, the concept of digital capital is a whole new concept which doesn't exist anywhere in the world. For, and this idea of digital capital and DPIs is creating what we call a new bargain, new grand bargain. Because most societies like India and elsewhere in Latin America and Africa, the challenge is how do you formalize a society? How do you go from having a small elite and a lot of people in the informal economy to a more inclusive society where everybody joins the system? And most people don't want to join the system because there's a lot of bureaucracy when you join the system. You have to pay taxes when you join the system. India has solved the issue by creating a very simple way of onboarding. 
So you can go and get, uh, uh, you know, get an ID with Aadhaar, get a bank account with KYC, get a mobile connection with KYC, start getting government benefits and transfers into your bank account. You can open a small store. You can then use the digital capital from your transactions to get access to credit. So the whole roadmap on inclusion which has come out here, and we think this is a unique model of inclusion because it empowers people with their own data. Sorry. Also, digital public infrastructure issues a challenge that is there in all societies. All countries today are fighting the question of how to balance inclusion and innovation. Uh, I'm sorry, regulation and innovation. So in the US, you have uh, lots of innovation, but now they're saying maybe we need to regulate some of this stuff. In Europe, there are lots of regulations, but they don't have enough innovators. In India, we have found the balance between regulation and innovation because of a partic participatory model of coordinated governance from the central government, from the regulators like the Reserve Bank, technology companies, uh, private sector, everybody has come together to create an architecture which finds the balance between innovation and regulation. So it ensures that there is innovation, but within the framework and guardrails of responsible regulation. Now, DPI is also not just a nice to have, it's something that's very strategic to have. For example, during the pandemic, India was able to transfer $4.5 billion into the bank accounts of 160 million beneficiaries. And as soon as the COVID thing started and people you know, started going home, they didn't have income sources, the government was able to launch this because there was the plumbing was there to enable this at very short notice to be able to roll it out. And the same plumbing is used to pay construction workers, farmers, and so on. So fundamentally, it's become part of the fabric of India's digital economy. Similarly, when the vaccination had to happen, the government built the COVID platform, which allowed India to have 2.5 billion vaccinations in two years. And you could go anywhere in the country, get a vaccination. You got a vaccination certificate in real time, and you could show it anywhere you went, uh, in India or abroad. And the data from this enabled real-time observability of how things were going. So digital technology and DPI has been fundamental to the fabric of India's development. And there are many other applications. India, for example, today has a completely digital tax system. So both our income tax and our indirect tax is completely digital. Everybody pays digitally, which is, again, ad, ad, you know, advancement done under Finance Minister Sitaraman in the last four to five years. We have a very streamlined system on the roads with our fast tag. Fast tag was built by the highway ministry, does 2.5 billion transactions a month, and all toll collection today is the same standard thing across the country. So the idea of digital infrastructure is now sort of occupied and taken root uh, everywhere, and that's very important. Now, as we go forward, we believe this approach of digital public infrastructure can also help on climate adaptation and mitigation. For example, one of the things which will happen in, in climate adaptation is you want to give anticipatory financing for building more resilient homes uh, in anticipation of you know, higher, higher sea levels or whatever, and you can do that using DPI. Or using ONDC, which, are, which is, our, again, another great innovation to create an open network for commerce, we can create a circular economy where things, uh, things get recycled. And as you go towards you know, uh, charging stations and energy going from you know, going to multiple uh, locations, many batteries, you can create an interoperable network using this technology. So fundamentally, not only has DPI has helped us so far, it's also going to help us in the future. Now, all this has been possible thanks to the Indian IT services. Indian IT service industry today is about $250 billion, hiring uh, you know, about 5 million people, and my friend Chandra, Tata's have been the Tata, Infosys are all leaders in this space, and that has given us the intellectual capital and experience to build all this technology. And to complement that, we have an extraordinary startup system. Again, I talked about the year 2016. In 2016, India had only 1,000 startups. Today, India has 100,000 startups. So this is not linear growth of 10% you know, a year. This is a 10x increase in the number of startups in India 
in the last seven years. And those, so the combination of the talent density of India, the startup density of India, and digital public infrastructure all come together to accelerate the transformation that you're seeing. So think about it as more than just technology. It's an innovative model for inclusive growth. In India's growth model is inclusive because it's designed to get people to be onboarded into society, modern society, get a bank account, get a mobile connection, get access to jobs, use their data and so on. And therefore it's not about a few people winning but everybody winning. We think this model is unique, it's collaborative, it's equitable and it's based on the principle that opportunity must be made available to everyone in the country irrespective of where they are. Now, this is something which is now gaining uh, global recognition. And now, whether it's Bill Gates or whether it's the IMF, they're all recognizing in India's unique contribution to digital public infrastructure. And therefore, there's now a major move afoot to take this model to 50 countries in five years. And there's a global coalition of multilaterals like the World Bank by IMF, uh, co-developed, many, many groups are coming together. The Indian government and uh, Minister Jay Shankar are leading the effort to take this idea abroad. So over the next few years, you will see the proliferation of these new way of thinking about digital infrastructure at population scale using an open architecture is going to be more and more ubiquitous and prevalent around the world. And we have seen that this is something that actually makes a huge difference because we have data to show for it. Thank you very much. Question? If you have time. Huh? If there are any questions for Mr. Nilakani. So raise your hand and we can try and get the microphone to you. You'll have to stand, sir, so that the person can get to you. Uh, we get a mic, I think. Very good morning, Mr. Nilkani. Thank you for your presentation. I've heard you a couple of times before, but today there was an element which uh, really caught my attention. And since I'm dealing with the environment and climate issues, and I know the fault lines and, and the requirements, so can uh, these digital prowess that India has uh, attained and is willing to share with the rest of the world, you know, can it address some of the core issues? Uh, now the problem is identified in, in, in the arena of climate uh, action, but the gap is of funding, the gap is between uh, developed and developing countries, for some countries, it's a survival issue. So if you can really... Uh, yeah. no, obviously, those yeah. are all beyond what digital products can do. But I'll give you a few examples, right? First is, there is going to be a huge need for individual cash transfers. First, you need it for resilience financing. Suppose you want to fortify a particular area. In climate adaptation, you want to make the building safer or, or, or stronger, you have to give direct money transfer there. Or after a particular episode, there's a tsunami or a flood or something, you need to do emergency funding. So again, you need uh, plumbing for that. Or you want to protect the forest and you want to pay people who live in the forest money not to cut down the trees in the Amazon, for example. You need infrastructure for that. So there are many, many use cases in the climate space where you need very good plumbing, which identifies a beneficiary, which has a bank account linked to the beneficiary and has the ability to transfer money to the beneficiary which they can withdraw any time. So that's one piece of it. Then, you know, with ONDC, we have built an open network for commerce. Now that's selling to somebody. But tomorrow when you want to have a circular economy, you also want to bring, you know, you want to complete the uh, cycle of collecting, you know, uh, things so that there's no wastage. You can build the reverse logistics also on the same platform. So we can actually enable circular economy. And then uh, we talked about uh, the the energy star, the, you know, if you have, you know, thousands of batteries all pumping up power, you need a grid to manage that intelligently. You can build that using a digital public infrastructure approach. 
Uh, I mean, there are many, many examples. Uh, for example, in India today, 2,000 cities approve building plans online. Now, you could now come out with new building codes uh, on better buildings, more sustainable buildings. You could embed them into the building plan approval process, and suddenly 2,000 cities will have the same process. So I'm just giving examples that if you have this kind of agile infrastructure at population scale, then it allows you to be far more resilient and flexible and adapt to new situations, including the ones required for climate adaptation and mitigation. The last question, please. Yes. Um, good morning, sir. My name is Venkatesh. I work with Accenture. Fantastic presentation. Thank you for your thoughts. Um, my question uh, was largely on one of the interesting points you picked up in the conversation today on the adoption and the rate of adoption over four years that we did see. I'm sure many of us in the industry are quite envious of it. Um, and we really like to know your thoughts on how trust or public trust in a technology like this has actually played a big role in adoption. And how do you see that panning out when you scale it up for other countries, not just for the when product? Panning out when? In other countries, right? Yeah. The role of trust in adoption. Well, I think uh, in the case of Aadhaar, it was very clear that people saw this as an economic asset. That, you know, they were stuck in their villages, they had to get to the city, they couldn't even board a train without an ID, they couldn't get a bank account without an ID, they couldn't get a job without an ID. So I think the people very clearly understood that this was an economic asset that will improve their lives. So there was a massive demand uh, all over the country for that. That's why we were able to get to a billion people in seven years. In the case of UPI also, I think it's been uh, seen as a huge convenience. For example, if I'm a vegetable vendor on the street, if I take digital payments, I will not have cash with me. That means somebody can't steal the cash from me or somebody can't extort the cash from me. Or if I go home, you know, somebody can't take away my money. So the fact that the money is going directly into the bank account and is secure is a huge reason. Safety is a big reason why they adopt digital payments. Or uh, small merchants do it because their productivity goes up. They're able to sell uh, without, very fast because the money collection happens with some sound box. So I think Indians are very, very adaptable. And once they see the convenience of a particular technology, they adopt it. And we're seeing that over and over again. The key thing is to make it population scale, low cost, small transactions, real time, and very convenient. If you do that, the rest will follow. Thanks.